This is Simon and White, the podcast at the crossroads of media, business, and politics. I'm Christian White, and former diplomat and finance guy, joined as always by Mark Simon, longtime media executive. Mark, say hello. Hello, everybody. All right, lots going on this week, and you know, continuing turbulence in the stock market, uh, considerable declines, mainly because investment banks, big banks, have been missing earnings expectations, or at least guiding down expectations for the early part of this year as they report on the fourth quarter of last year. Just recently, Goldman Sachs came out uh, and said that it was um, uh, facing serious, uh, well, you know, significant turbulence going forward. Um, and basically what's, what's the short explanation for this has been that the cost of capital is going up, that bond prices are going up just a little bit, but it's, it's a lot by recent standards. Now, in effect, this is still free money or actually a negative interest rate. If you look at U.S. bonds where they're below 2% and inflation is running at 7%, that still is basically the government paying you to take their money if you're a big corporation. Um, but things seem to be changing. Think the market seems to be understanding that there is a gradual tightening going on by the Federal Reserve. I mean, they're still buying mortgages, uh, they're still expanding their balance sheet to use their euphemism for printing dollars like Venezuela or like some other banana republic. And of course, Congress has shown no real appetite to rein in spending, even if some of the at least massive just for fund spending um, seems to be on hold thanks to two Democratic senators who are, are uh, perhaps looking either at their conscience or at Joe Biden's popularity or a little of each. Um, what do you think, Mark? Is this a is this a big turning point? Is this um, you know a big change in, in outlook? Um, I think the one thing that kind of interested me was I think both J.P. Morgan and UBS decided that they're going to start going after clients under five million dollars. In other words, they were going to go back to clients. It tells me that what they've done. I just read the Goldman Sachs stuff. I think the problem is they've turned into a giant hedge fund trading house and. You know, essentially, they've given up large parts of the market. You know, I mean, if you have less than three million dollars, they're not really interested in you in terms of wealth management trading or anything like that. So, I mean, their their profits per employee, which is a measure they use. I think they decided for a while they were just going to be the galaxy guardians of the galaxy and deal with all the elites. And I think that's what's impacted them. In other words, I think they left themselves open in a couple of areas. And I think technology's hit them. In other words, why if you've got if you've got two million dollars in shares and you're you're the one who makes the decisions, Charles Schwab works just fine for you. You know what I'm saying? I mean that that's that's perfectly fine. Um, but I do I do think that the problem they have is is they've turned into these giant hedge funds, these trading houses, and guess what happens? You made a really good point. You know, if money is cheap, it's free money right now. But if you were paying you know, if you were paying one cent on the dollar and that was your profit, your profit was five, and now you're paying three cents on the dollar, you know, maybe this, it's still cheap. It's cheap as chips, but it costs you a little bit more. And I think that that's basically impacted them. I also think this too, and I think this is where I don't like to give him credit, but I think Jamie Dimon is right. They're not in the office. Okay. All these people are not there. I was in West Palm Beach the other day seeing a private bank. Nobody was there. There was nobody there. We met in the conference room. There was nobody there. My point is, is that maybe, and I'm sure all hell will break loose from the keyboard jockeys who want to stay around their pools, that people will decline. They're not getting, um, they're not getting the things that they need in terms of people being in the office. They're not creating new deals. They're not doing a lot of things. They're basically catching. That's the one thing about this pandemic. Basically, if you're sitting at home, I don't care what anybody says. I've seen it in my business. I've talked to guys. Most people are just catching right now. They're not sitting in the office, coming up with new ideas, trying to go out. They're basically working their portfolios that they have. I think just the market caught up with them. That's my, that's my take on this. There's really no other reason in my mind besides the interest rate change, which is big, of course. But they, they, should, they should have worked around that. So... You know, I mean, and by the way, I mean, who really cares if the big banks don't make money or not? You know what I'm saying? But Goldman Sachs managed to put out some pretty big bonuses right. the other day. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not crying for them. Right. To me, it just has some echoes of 2000 where, 
Basically, Alan Greenspan, the Fed chairman at the time, saw Y2K coming, added liquidity, which helped juice the dot-com boom, the real spike where people were investing in just absolute garbage. Uh, Y2K comes and goes without the end of the world, and he absorbs liquidity, and that just you know brings down the market, causes the correction. So. Uh, you know, we'll wait and see. But uh, this mar this quarter seems like one in particular with tightening in the Fed that there are going to be some significant headwinds. And we did see slowdowns. I mean, China, for example, was chug chugging along at, you know, the first two quarters. Recovery from, recover in other words, recovery from COVID. Now they're back down. Third quarter, four point something percent. Fourth quarter, they're claiming 4.1. Everybody I talk to says more like 2%. China's a big part of everybody's game. You know, and so we'll see, have to see what's happening. Also, I'm sure the number of advisory deals they've gotten, advisory um, um, assignments they've gotten have gone down. There's no doubt about that in many ways, you know what I'm saying? Because, again, people aren't sitting together, they're not doing it. Right. All right, switching gears to media, Almor Latour, who is the CEO of the Wall Street Journal, a, a Dutch national, I believe, um, came out with a very long article giving themselves a pat on the back. Um, and it's so interesting. You're sort of playing to a conservative audience. He actually didn't criticize implicitly or explicitly the editorial page. You'd expect that. He is a CEO of that part of the Wall Street Journal, too. But talking about the Wall Street Journal's objectivity, talking about stories they've broken. Uh, incidentally, I guess it's not current, but he didn't mention Theranos. And it was the Wall Street Journal that in 2015, I believe, originally started the dominoes falling over with that company. Um, and frankly, some good investigative reporting that Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes, recently convicted of fraud, uh, really tried to intimidate the journal into not doing. But here you have Almore, who's probably a lefty kind of guy coming out saying everything is fine. If you go and you look at the comments to this article, uh, and I'll put them up, uh, at least in our YouTube um, uh, account, and you see that the readers are not buying it. They realize the Wall Street Journal news division has gone lefty, has gone woke, is you know putting in articles with weird pronouns, uh, talking about articles that are of interest, maybe if you're in freshman seminar at Smith College, but not if you're paying 400 plus bucks a year for what you thought was a capitalist uh, news application. <laughs> what do you think about the letter and the response? I like Almore. I, I knew him when I, when I was in Hong Kong with him. I think he's a very competent manager. He's probably the best they can get over there. And I mean that, that he'd be good anywhere. Um, but the fact of the matter is they've lost control of the newsroom, I think, for two reasons. First of all, Murdoch. And I know this sounds odd, but Murdoch decided they wanted to be more of a general. He wanted to compete with the New York Times. He's not. And because the bread and butter of that paper, which most of us pay $400 a year for, um, is financial news. We want we want financial information. We want that long, painful <laughs> editorial process of the journal to tell us things. And quite frankly, uh, I'll give you some examples. In China, their business reporting in China basically is a PR release for the for the for the government because they're desperate to get back in, um, and so they're trying not to offend anybody in China. And they'll always what they'll do is they'll always pull out one article where they did something, you know, to upset the Chinese. But there's five articles behind it where they did nothing. Um, even their article the other day on the uh, slowdown of the Chinese economy was basically was nothingness. It was there. There's nothing there um, uh, in terms of real analysis um, or insight. Um, I think the problem is, is that basically they're based in New York City. They've been trying to. Uh, be a general newspaper. That means the type of people they're hiring are not financial people. Um, the company has subjected itself um, as Fox News the same way because of this whole Roger Ailes mess. And I think because Rupert's getting older. Look, the paper in the news section is moving to the left. Their, uh, their Hong Kong, I mean, I'm sorry, their, their U Washington, D.C., the top correspondent acknowledged that in an article in the New York Times, the, the top the bureau chief, and um, I can't, Paul, best Paul, I can't remember Paul's last name, but he acknowledged it in a, in a, edit, in a, in a piece in the, uh, in the New York Times, how basically their readers were not happy with their coverage of Trump and Republicans. And I must say, I mean, it's obvious. Look, I'm an ideological guy. I know when someone's writing with me or writing against me or just writing straight, and they're not even writing straight anymore. I mean, this, 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 They've kind of lost the plot. They've got 3.5 million subscribers. They've 
basically been doing okay. They're financially all right. It's 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 the juggernaut. It's hard to stop. But my personal belief is is that until they decide who they're serving, look, their market is still still 70% white and Asian males. Okay, that's still their market. These people are overwhelmingly conservatives. If they're not conservatives, they're not from the planet wokeness. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The editorial page is incredibly popular. It's probably the most popular part of the entire newspaper, uh, much to the chagrin of the news staff. That paper really, quite frankly, you know, it is is they are really going to end up walking away from the most important part of their business, and that is um, business. So I, 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 I think that's the mistake they've made. You know, if you go woke, you go broke. But if you also don't service your readers, I mean, their readers are who their readers are. And, you know, you can talk to people who are around it and who, who were part of it, who are the serious news guys, and they'll tell you that that's, that's exactly what's happened inside the organization. You know, and, and, and that's largely, I think, part of this is, and I like these guys, part of this is, is that Murdoch has somewhat of a feel and his senior manager have somewhat of a feel for the uh, for the uh, uh, the U.S. market. But I don't think they really understand uh, that they can't really compete with The New York Times on the subjects The New York Times is covering and uh, basically with the staff that they have. Their biggest problem is their human resources department. And that's the problem. Right. Yeah, it's a shame. It's uh, the drift is palpable, um, and it's you know it, it's it's it makes no business sense at all, no rating sense at all. Um, and yeah, we'll see if it if it turns around. I, I, I look. I I know I know one two three four. I know about six people that have canceled their subscription to the Wall Street Journal. You know that's 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 twenty four hundred U S dollars. That's not that's not chicken feed in the world of publishing. You know what I'm saying? And God knows how many hundreds more, and God knows the people that don't sign up. Also, they have a very weird thing, like, you know, the, the New York Times bought The Athletic, which I don't think is a fit at all. But the new, the Wall Street Journal, 70% white, male, Asian are their, is their readership. Okay, they seem to be ashamed of that, by the way. Um, and they're, they, they, who's the natural market for sports? That would be a huge market for sports for them. Yet... They don't touch it. They don't even do a good job covering the business of sports. And, and I, I think it's a, I, they have a natural lead in there with some tie-ins, with some sister companies, Fox Sports. They have a lot of things that they could be doing, and they are not doing right. it. You know, a uh, different media story, but sticking still with media, Donald Trump, former president, man who needs no introduction, really, uh, did an interview on NPR. And as you would suspect, it was disastrous. He cut it short. Um, that's another thing. They didn't, you know, if you're going to go with a hostile media outlet, one safeguard is to um, insist that it's live so it can't be edited to your detriment. They didn't do that. So he was also, they also promised something like 15 minutes on camera and it was cut to nine or 11 when Trump got upset. And of course, this is NPR and this is the new NPR. It was always lefty. Tucker Carlson had a good diatribe on this, on how it's gone completely insane more recently. And so it's not, why do you think the election was stolen from you? That was, why do you continue lying that the election was stolen from you? You know, are you still beating your wife? That kind of journalism. What do you think is going on? I mean, Donald Trump is not some novice when it comes to dealing with the media. He's been at this for 40 years or so, uh, and he didn't seem um, that unwilling to upset and ignore left-wing outlets when he was president, but maybe that's changed now that he's doing this own media thing and in his post-presidency. you have any guess what's going on there? They said they've been trying to get Trump in the in the chair for five, seven years. And he probably finally said yes. I mean, Trump wants to be liked. That's his biggest flaw in many ways as a politician, you know. And you're right. None of none of the things that he should have gotten, he got. Um, he should have said, this is my list. This is what I want. If you want to talk to me, you talk to me live. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 and that's it. And I, I just think... I mean, the one thing is when you watch the interview, 
does this interview hurt Trump with Republicans at all? And even the general public? The answer is no. The guy is complete. Guys, the, the, the reporters like got a central casting. You know, if all he would have needed to wear was a tweed jacket and have a pipe. You know what I'm saying? He was as smarmy as they come. His questions were not even good. They were just accusatorial. Um, but, you know, Trump didn't do a good job. He doesn't do a good job in interviews like that. And as usual, who's advising Trump? Probably Trump. Mm -hmm. So, again, you know, he, for, he, he I think he forgets how hated he is. That's the one thing that always cracks me up about him. He just doesn't really understand how much they hate him. I don't even know why he talks to him. I'm, 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 I'm constantly amazed, you know, why people I've, I've got two. We've got two or three news organizations won't even deal with, you know, and they they're like, why won't you deal with us? I'm going like, because yeah. you hate us. You know, and these are Western, you know, I don't even deal with the Wall Street Journal China team because I don't trust them. Yeah. Politico you know? is on my and, list uh, for, for for clients where I just tell them no, I, do I, not ever return a call. Politico, no Politico, they're just uh, dishonest, unethical yeah. uh, liars, really. Po yeah. Politico is Politico is problematic as well for a lot of conservatives. I mean, I think the thing is you have to understand, you know, it's really what Glenn Reynolds from Instapundent says. They're really an ex some of these guys are really extensions of, you know, this group. And NPR, um, I don't know what's happened to NPR other than other than, you know, just basically they don't care anymore. You know, in other words, it's like whatever. You know, we have to get our money from um, these donors. These donors insist that we do this. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I heard a story about the Atlantic the other day that was really disturbing from somebody. Really, the person was really that, you know, Mrs. Jobs, you know, the owner of the Atlantic, you know, actually criticized some stories that were she saw. Nobody saw them as like against COVID, but just more realistic stories. And apparently she was on the phone about it or she was complaining or her people were complaining, whoever it was. But they said, you know, it, and so she. They're going to you're going to write for your paycheck. And that's what they're doing. And NPR gets all their money from the left. Now, there's no more independence. There's no more moderates who donate to NPR. NPR money comes from a much more government money than people think, but also just corporates that are looking for coverage, looking for a cover. Yeah. Political cover. Yep. No, it's just become another sort of bulletin board for lefty snowflakes. Um, shifting back to geopolitics, you know, I've been I've been bullish on Russia uh, and invest. It's not a big part of my portfolio, but in RSX, which is the Van Act Russia ETF, and it's just some very familiar names in Russia. Simple reason that they actually have their financial house in order. They really have low debt to GDP. Um, they actually pay interest rates. They pay interest on on their debt. So um, even though Americans can't buy initial offerings of new debt instruments that are Russian sovereign. Um, their workarounds, it's a little too complicated for me, but uh, they are reacting to inflation. They are raising interest rates. That's caused the ruble to be stable and trending up a little bit. Uh, and they have, even though they pay a little bit of lip service to the green agenda and the religion of climate change, uh, the fact is they are still investing in oil production, energy production. They make things like coal and iron um, and I do think the current Ukraine crisis will blow over. I think Putin has made his point. Uh, he does not want Ukraine or Georgia in NATO. Uh, and even if the United States is still talking tough, I think this is interesting. And there's a financial angle on this. The thing we've been offering, the so-called nuclear option, if he invades Ukraine, um, of kicking Russia out of SWIFT, which is the Belgian-based mechanism for a lot of cross-border financial transactions, big and small. Uh, the Germans apparently behind closed doors, this was broke by a paper in Dusseldorf who said, no, that's, that's off the table. We are not willing to kick Russia out of SWIFT, end of story. And this is sort of consistent with what Germany is doing more broadly, which is they're fine for the United States to deter Russia to pay the bills, to have the big military, which is still over there for some reason. But, um, you know, meanwhile, they're going to buy more gas directly from Russia with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. So, uh, Mark, I'm still fairly bullish. Van Eck, the Russia ETF, RSX, it's off significantly, I think, because of tension. Um, but to me, as with many producers of real things who have not actually bought into the green agenda, I am still fairly bullish long term. Uh, do you think I'm wrong to be? No, I think you're right. Um, look, 
very quickly a few things. First of all, if you're an investor and somebody walks into your office and goes, oh, my God, we've got to pull out of these stocks because the Biden administration is going to press its allies to uh, do something. Uh, don't pull out by the dip when people who think that because we can't get our allies to do anything. If you can't get the Germans to push Russian, the Russians for potentially invading a country and starting a war, then you can't get anything done. So I think this is I think this sign is a very hearty sign to the Chinese and to other regimes that basically said, OK, the, the Iranians, all we have to do is keep the Germans happy financially and then we'll be OK. Um, so I, I, I think that's going to have to figure into people's plans now that these announcements of sanctions and all that stuff probably aren't going to have a huge effect on companies that are willing to work around it. Um, and the question is, is what does the Biden administration do next after that? Do you just basically say, OK, no more Mercedes, no more BMWs in our office, just, you know, sanction Deutsche Bank? I'm not so sure that happens. The second point that I'd make on this is that, look, with the Russians, one of the things about the green agenda is I, I am fine with it, but it is suicide in many ways for developing countries. We are going to, I always credit Holman Jenkins of the Wall Street Journal with this. He said, like, if you're buying a Toyota Corolla and it gets 40 miles to the gallon and gas costs four bucks a gallon is, and, and the, the, the Prius and the Toyota Corolla costs 20,000, but the Prius costs 40,000. Well, first of all, it's going to take a long time to equal that 20, you know, to get that differential back just driving for, for an individual but what are you going to do? What are you going to do when your world changes and you go down to dollar fifty a gallon? In other words, nobody else is buying because everybody's in EVs. So oil is, you know, back to thirty dollars a barrel, thirty-five, and which they'll still make money extracting. So the point is that a lot of nations are not going to go with that. In other words, the green agenda is a rich man's agenda and a rich country's agenda, and most of the world isn't rich, so. Africa is going to keep buying cars. You know, the Middle East is going to keep buying cars. Most of the uh, Southeast Asia is going to keep buying cars that burn petrol. So I think Putin's fine for a while. I mean, yep, he won't be getting $120 a barrel, but he'll still be there. His companies will still be operating. Employment will still be full. Everybody will be doing fine. Um, that's that's the second point. And, and the final point really is um, I do not think in any way, shape, or form that it's probably a good idea for us to oppose Putin on every single thing just because right. he's Putin. And and I know that sounds like I can't see a strategic interest for us in Ukraine. I can differentiate between Ukraine and Taiwan. I easily can do that. It's pretty easy. I, I have a real concern about committing U.S. troops or the idea of going to the mat for Ukraine. Um, I'm fine with causing the Russians problems in a lot of areas if they do it. But I, I really think the problem is, is, is that I think Putin, there are things that he wants. I do not think he's trying to reconstitute the Soviet Union. I know some people might have a problem with that. I don't see it. I think Putin's, Putin's biggest concern is the same concern as a lot of people. He's got a declining country in terms of population. He's got outward migration to deal with. He's trying to basically stay in, in, in some type of a power player. He does believe in basic Russian destiny that they should be a major player in the world. I, I, I'm not sure you engage him everywhere, you know what I'm saying? But let's remember, it was the Obama administration that let him back into Syria, right. you know what I'm saying? And so now we're surprised. Right, right. Well, and I think he has a lot more stability than, you know, the European crowd at the State Department and the CIA, which drives a lot of the Biden administration. I mean, oil's at 85 bucks a barrel, depending on which index you use. That's good for him. Um, and, uh, you know, people say that, oh, we have to be strong there because Xi Jinping is watching very closely. We'll make decisions about Taiwan. I think Xi Jinping would be fine if we got bogged down in Ukraine. That would give him an even freer hand in the Western Pacific. I don't think he, he really cares what's going on. And as you point out, you know, uh, Crimea and the small parts of Eastern Ukraine that Putin has taken are not a stepping off point to invade Western Europe like Hitler. 
it is just basically Putin playing a weekend well and, and, and nipping two or three parts of countries or four, you know, consider the parts of Georgia he's grabbed that are ethnically Russian and sort of opportunistic. It's, uh, we seem forever to run this through. Either he's Hitler or he's Stalin, and really he's neither. And I, I just think the idea that the U.S. snaps its fingers and the whole world you know, jumps up and down is it. I mean, I've, I've been, you know, H.R. Masters book, the old Battlegrounds book, it's got its pluses and minuses, but it is realistic in that. Like, you know, you just can't show up someplace and, and say to tough people, hey, you're going to do it because we're all, by the way, we all have degrees from uh, Harvard and we all went to Ivy League schools and <laughs> we're the really smart people. So you should listen to us. And, you know, that that's that's essentially U.S. foreign policy right now. <laughs> I hate to say it. And you get when you get guys like Putin right, and Xi right. Jinping and you know, the Iranians, they don't care. You know what I'm saying? They don't care. As my daughter always says, Putin don't care. You know, <laughs> just like Honey Badger. Um, you know, while we're on the topic of uh, we mentioned oil, Bitcoin is not up. Bitcoin, um, obviously, the premier. Um, cryptocurrency is down around 41,500 and it's been up and down, but generally declining lately. Uh, now, if you go back far, it's, you know, a year or two, it's still up significantly. But the idea that people are going to pile into this as a hedge for inflation instead of gold um, doesn't seem to be playing out. You and I have been skeptics. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the dollar is still backed by the ability of the U.S. government to print dollars and tax and borrow. Um, and crypto is backed by nothing. Uh, what do you think? I'm, I'm, thing is, I've been, I'm, I'm like the guy who, I'm like the Gordon Chang, you know, Gordon Chang, the guy who always predicts the fall of China. I'm the Gordon Chang of crypto. I always expect crypto to depart to end tomorrow. Um, I think crypto is a lot more stable than we think. People seem to like it. There's a large enough market out there to play it. But exactly the point, it hasn't really done a whole lot. It should be doing a lot more based on the thesis that I have been told, at least, or what I believe about crypto hedge against all the bad things that are going on in the world. Um, gold's over 1800. It's not going a whole lot of places um, right in the past couple of months. I, I think that basically I'm going to continue to stay out of crypto. Um, I'm just like I say, I'm still kind of shocked that it's hanging around $41,000. Um, I myself expected to see this, you know what I'm saying? And it's kind of gone like this. And I, 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 I'm, I'm still waiting it for it for somebody to say, you know, I mean, let's face it. If, if you bought crypto eight years ago, five, four years ago, five years ago at, you know, $500 and you're sitting there going, hey, I'm worth $7 million. At a certain point in time, you're going to say, you know what, I'm going to take out four million of those dollars. And once that starts, and that will happen, that's just, a, that, that will happen. As once that starts happening, are there going to be a lot of people to pay you $41,000 for a Bitcoin? I'm not so sure, you know. Right. And, and, and the way, you know, the, 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 all these arguments about energy costs and all these things and still can't, still unusable. I mean, people come to me in our hotel business and say, we'd like you to set up something and take Bitcoin. I'm like, no, you know, because the cost of dealing with it is so expensive. In other words, you know, you have to call if you if, if somebody comes to us and says, I want to use Bitcoin, I got to charge a buck 50 rather than a buck because I got 50 cents in compliance and all the other handling and on the other end and the risk involved. You know what I'm saying? Right. So it's not not worthwhile. Right. Now, this is the one thing that I agree with Janet from another planet, Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, when she pointed out that the transaction costs for Bitcoin are not cheap at all. No, it's not. It's not. I, I actually I looked at it seriously and I'm going like, well, you know, we're, we're going to have to risk, you know, we have to do all all these different things, you know, to actually get the actual money out. I can't pay my employees in Bitcoin. They're not going to take it. Maybe 20 years from now I can. But, you know, most of them aren't going to take right. it. Uh, Stick to cash, Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and Montana Militia Specie. It's all uh, probably more secure in the long run. Um, last topic, you talked about China before, back on that, but with the supply chain. You know, uh, you go to the market, I go to the market, everyone goes to the market, and the supply chain is not back to normal. This was somewhat you know, understandable, uh, although frankly, it didn't seem as acute at the peak of the coronavirus crisis in the spring of 2020, when people were being ordered to stay home from coast to coast. Um, and it seems to be this lingering problem. The administration blames 
it for inflation or blames inflation on the supply chain problem, but uh, it just doesn't seem to be solving itself rapidly, working itself out, um, which leads me to believe that government actually might be the problem here. Uh, what do you think? What do you think is going on? Is this a China problem or is this a U.S. problem? Both? I think China is, I think that we're past the China problem. And what I mean by that is I think people can get an Apple iPhone now. Uh, the furniture is starting to show back up a little bit in the stores. The problem that we're seeing now is, is essentially, and this is all on the U.S. government, is we are seeing shelves at the Costco. We are seeing food shelves that are not fully stocked. We are having people go to, uh, when I go to the stop and shop, my Breakstone cottage cheese is not always there. So I, if, there's, if there's some there, I've actually gone to the point now I won't take the last one. You know what I'm saying? In other words, like if there's three there, I'll take two, but I'll leave one for somebody, you know, pay yeah, it yeah, forward. Well. Now we've mm -hmm. got a whole thing. We've got a new shopping philosophy, pay it for it. Don't take the last one, you know? Um, but we are seeing, first of all, rises in prices on things such as eggs, milk, meat. We were talking before the podcast, chicken, and these things mm -hmm. are not showing up. And what is the administration going to do? Now we're going to start having these mandatory vaccine checks for truck drivers. So you can bet in the cra some crazy blue state, they're going to say, we're now checking all trucks from out-of-state plates. So they're going to stop a truck. They're going to check a guy to make sure he doesn't have COVID. Let's, let's say they stop, every, let's say every 30th truck, the guy has COVID. Every 50th truck, the guy has COVID. And he's fine. He's asymptomatic. He's driving along. What happens to that rig? You know what I'm saying? I mean, the, I, you, when you talk to people who are out there, I'm just not going to send trucks to New Jersey anymore. I'm just not going to send trucks to these places. You know what I'm saying? The point being is, is that what we need now is less regulation to get everything to the markets. We, we have to have some tolerance for food workers and other people. You know, in other words, like in the UK, five days for hospital staff now. If they're out, they can come back. We need that all across the board. I, I had some flight canceled the other day. Very nice conversation with the United staff. They said it's a combination of weather, but most of it is they don't have people to fly. Look, we are seeing real hardship. Inflation's part of it. But... Look what just happened recently. We're having the smallest orange juice crop, orange crop in the last 45 years for a variety of reasons that have nothing to do with COVID. There's some type of blight and there's some other things going on. But that's going to raise the cost of orange juice. Okay, orange juice is going to cost more. Everybody wants to feed, have an orange juice. You can't have an orange juice because it costs so much. I saw something the other day that absolutely, it was on, uh, on a website, Wings at a restaurant are at market price now. They put market price for wings, chicken wings. <laughs> that's what you do with lobster. You put market yeah, price because the guys can't, they're not, they don't know what they're going to have to pay that, that week. So they don't want it. They don't want to constantly keep changing it, you know? And, and I think they say that it's market price. That tells you what's going on. And I, I think politically for the Democrats, I don't know how they get around this. I, I think they've got this. And I think the problem that they have is, is essentially um, their their base is rich and then young single people, white people, you know what I'm saying, who are basically don't look at the price when they go shopping and they yeah. eat out a lot. But it's just, it's really disheartening for the United States when I've spoken to some friends. I, I, I went to Whole Foods the other day, another story, Whole Foods. I asked the guy if they had some bell peppers around. He goes, if you don't see it, we don't have it. None in the back, nothing. <laughs> he said, everything that comes in goes out, you know, on the thing. And, and, and you are seeing people hoarding and you are seeing that. And that's, that's going to cause a lot of problems for folks down the road. Now, yeah. we're going to probably come out of Omicron. There'll probably be something else that Moderna will want to stick a needle in us for down the road. But we're going to go into, the, do we come into the fall, next fall? And, and we still got shortages, still, still have, you know, ships sitting out for two weeks and all those things, I think, I think it starts wearing people down because people expect us to be able to solve things. And then we're seeing places solve things, quite frankly, such as Florida. 
you know, and Texas and all the other places are solving things. And the blue states right. aren't. Look what just happened in Cleveland the other day. They couldn't even clear the streets. They could, the mayor couldn't even clear the streets. And he, he started to blame systematic racism. I'm not kidding. You can tell where he was going. To <laughs> of course. Conference. You know, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, that there was expectations and the, all these problems and there were cultural issues. They're going, whatever, pal, whatever, you know, so this has to be what it is. <laughs> right. Well, it seems the administration is, is not succeeding in even appearing to react to this. They did something where they said they were taking the Port of Los Angeles and Long Beach 24 hours a day. They didn't, incidentally. Um, and then they sort of blamed uh, meat conglomerates. And there are some conglomerates in there who do what um, people would probably consider unfair business practices. Ranchers keep a comparatively small amount of, of what they produce and the risk they take. But at any rate, that's all the time we have for this episode of Simon White. And if you liked listening to it as much as you enjoyed making it, please click subscribe. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks.